So, um, today I'm going to be talking about the Marlet missile. So, the idea of Marlet, originally developed under the lightweight multi-role missile program, is precisely that. It's designed to be lightweight and multi-role. So, logistically, very easy. Um, in regard to space, very easy. Uh, in regard to addressing a number of smaller threats, very, very easy. And that really is its selling point, its versatility. So the idea is that it's going to enter UK service in 2024. And I think Indonesia has also made some sort of order um, of an unknown quantity. Anyway, Marlet is interesting because it's not specifically categorised. It's a lightweight multi-role missile, as I was saying. But multi-role could mean a lot of stuff. It could be used for surface-to-air capability surface-to-surface -surface capability, air-to-surface -surface capability, really all sorts. Uh, and I think this concept is particularly interesting because it takes innovation in a really quite strange direction. Uh, it's not that modular. It's designed to be generalist, which is something we don't often see. Nowadays, it's moving more towards specialization with modularity so that one can change that specialization. But that's not really the case with Marlet. And I think, you know, largely this comes with Star Starstreak's success, because there's a lot of the same technology incorporated. So, for those of you who saw it, uh, which none of you will have, I did a video on Starstreak, and the technology within that was incredibly successful, the kinetic warhead effectively. Marlet isn't kinetic, but it uses similar uh, tracking technologies, similar sensor technologies. The success of Starstreak or perceived success, wasn't just in its capability, in its success as an anti-air munition, but in its perceived versatility, its potential ability to take down threats like even armoured vehicles, like tanks. Uh, people were saying it was that powerful, and they've incorporated some of that technology on Marlet. So, to an extent, it's a development. <laughs> And the idea of Marlet, generally, as I've said, it's multi-role, it's designed to react to smaller threats. It's not going to be taking down anything huge, uh, no warships, but these smaller threats. And it's proven hugely potent, particularly uh, in asymmetric littoral operations. At the moment, we have four variations, and they're all at different stages of development. Uh, because it hasn't quite entered service yet, but all of the tests have seemed to have gone really quite well. So first off, surface-to-air. This is pr pretty conventional. Uh, you effectively meet air-based platforms, especially effective against UUS, uh, UAS even, not UUS. Um, and this could be launched through a surface of a ship or through land-based systems, so it's versatile in that way. It can also be used as a surface-to-surface -surface munition. Uh, generally most effective, ideally against light to medium armour. So they, I believe, launched a Marlet missile in the naval context from HMS Sutherland, and they used it. They're already looking at synergies uh, directed at fast craft. So they launched, I believe, five and four made it to the target uh, as this thing was trying to defend itself. So they launched it alongside a 30mm Bushmaster automated machine gun, and found that it's incredibly effective in getting rid of these fast craft, these really annoying little threats. So I thought that was pretty pretty notable. They were already looking at synergies, and the surface-to-surface -surface capability, particularly when this is versatile, is hugely important. Because it's smaller, it's logistically easier, it will probably, on ships at least, be incorporated in a similar manner to something like Sea Sparrow. Uh, and the manner in which it's launched means that it can react incredibly quickly and it can take down light to medium armour. So that makes it incredibly versatile in taking down a lot of different threats. The air-launched version is still quite heavily in development, but likely it's going to be launched from rotary wing platforms and UAS, but potentially from fixed wing platforms as well, because as I was saying, its size uh, and its utility mean that on... Let's say certain hard points of planes, a lot can be equipped, potentially even in pod style setups, as we saw um, either with hydro rockets or with something like Spear 3, in that you can equip a lot in a small uh, space and they're incredibly potent and 
can take out a lot of stuff uh, very quickly, and that's incredibly useful. They've done extensive testing with the with some helicopters, but also the uh, I believe it's Shebel camcopter, which is a sort of UAS. So the incorporation of these on UAS systems, I guess that's tautology. The incorporation of these on UAS is huge because they are small, they are lightweight, and you can basically have a lot of them to huge effect on something that generally doesn't have such payload, I guess, size capability. What we're also looking at is a potential maritime variant. So generally, uh, again, a lot of these are sort of intermingled because uh, surfaces can be maritime surfaces uh, and air platforms can be maritime air platforms, but the maritime variant is more focused on equipping it on either the Wildcat, I believe, so naval helicopters for the UK, and I assume they probably designed something for the Merlin, meaning that one can take out threats, these smaller threats, from further away, which is incredibly useful, and potentially equipping it on fast craft that can travel out, and if they're automated, that's even better. So it could have a lot of potential uses because of its size, because uh, of actually its range, considering its size, and because of how versatile the number of targets it can hit is, and it can clearly be equipped on a lot of stuff. So it's multi-roll, it's lightweight. As I said, this lightweight nature is really actually incredibly important because it means you can transport a lot of them. It weighs only 13 kilograms, which is really well, which is really light. Um, it has a warhead mass of only three kilograms, I think. A length of 1.3 meters, a diameter of 76 millimeters, and its detonation mechanism is based upon laser proximity sensors. In regard to how it propels itself, it uses two-stage solid propellants, so one for launch and then one for guidance, and it has an 8km operational range, which is actually pretty large considering its pretty small size. It has a maximum speed of Mach 2, travelling at, I think, around 2,500 kilometers. And for its guidance system, this is where the Star Street technology really comes in. It's got a multi-mode guidance, utilising, uh, actually, beam-riding Salkos, or semi-active uh, laser guidance. But to focus on the Salkos, it's produced by Thales, and a lot of the success of Star Streak actually came from this Salkos system. Uh, and it's been upgraded for a more universal application. So with beam riding Saclos, for those who don't know, the idea is that it's pretty simple. The sighting device emits directional signal and then a detector of some sort, generally in the tail of the missile, I think that's true. It's sort of rear to midsection of uh, Marlot. It looks for the signal and electronic systems within that component keep the missile centered uh, uh, through homing and centering electrical components and effectively what this means is that it's hugely accurate far far more accurate than star streak uh, because it has a more versatile target range but this minimizes collateral damage hugely and allows it to be much much more maneuverable because you don't have three different darts which are largely kinetic that's rather useful so it's not semi-active radar homing it's sacloss um it's not semi-active laser homing, it's not sort of uh, target illumination, but it is target beam direction. So in any case, basically it uses the Seclos for mid-stage guidance, and then for the terminal stage, it uses a combination of semi-active laser seeker and uh, infrared homing, which is fairly common among a lot of missiles, and I think Star Streak incorporated something similar. But what we've discovered is that those sort of technologies really do perform incredibly well um, when one's considering these sorts of munitions, and it's for more than just anti-air targets. As we were saying, stuff like Star Streak has incredible application beyond anti-air, even though it was designed for purely anti-air capability. And again, that 
massively minimizes collateral damage. Incredible targeting systems means that munitions can be more impactful. And it means that one doesn't have to use large munitions, which perhaps are more imprecise, and one can focus those on larger targets. The smaller targets can be neutralized by smaller, uh, less, I guess, more space optimizing munitions. And so I think that's probably where I'll leave it, because I don't want to go on too much, but that's about it for Marlott.